Hi everybody, my name is Marta Mama. I'm your basic queer bitch, and I'm here to explain to you all the references about Drag Race España season three. And this episode we have the Snatch Game. Fume gusto, siempre gusto. So as in every season for the Snatch Game, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are new to this channel just looking for references. So welcome to my channel. I want to thank all these lovely people that sent me PayPal's to support my channel last week. If you want to support my channel, you have that information down below. And this episode was amazing. Again, it looks like the first two episodes were just a fluke and we're back to Drag Race España flow of things. So I'm very happy I enjoyed it very much, but I'm sure most of you are very confused, so don't worry, I've got your back. I'm going to explain you all of these characters. But we're going to start with the new day in the workroom. We get to know that Banya is feeling a little bit low. It's her inner saboteur, you know, she her imposter syndrome and her insecurities and she's not having the best of the days, but it's really nice how all of the girls are supporting her and how vulnerable she can seem. It doesn't feel super produced like it does many times in Drag Race US. So I truly appreciate these moments. Then Supreme comes in and we get to know that's the reading challenge this week. Some highlights of the reading challenge. Bestia did a very good job. I wasn't expecting it. Paquita did an amazing job. Uh, and Ornella did a very good job too. I really loved that Pink Cha took that moment just to encourage and say nice things about Bania. And Bania also said nice things about the girls. And after that, she needed a little bit of a moment. And she explains this story about once upon a time when she was working with Supreme in Paris and they got stuck in an elevator. And she says that she was feeling trapped and she's feeling trapped right now. And it's really cool because you can see that Spain is, so, it's, it's not the smallest country. It's a rather large country in Europe, but we all know each other, you know, like, Suprem has worked with a lot of these queens and a lot of these queens have worked with each other many times. So it's different than in the US. Imagine that there is just like a Texas drag race, maybe. We get to know that this uh, episode is going to be the Snatch Game and then the Snatch Game starts. Like that we have skipped all the workroom conversations, all the walkthrough in the workroom saying, oh, I don't know what character to do. I was going to do this character. No, I want to do that character too. None of that, like Snatch Game starts, which is okay, I guess, because even though it was a very long episode, one hour and 20 minutes, um, I think they didn't play that in order to play a lot of conversations that they had afterwards. And I think it was the right decision because the conversations they had afterwards were super juicy and super interesting. So the Snatch Game starts and the first gag is that the guests for the Snatch Game are Poopy Poison as Karina. If you remember Poopy, she's from Drag Race España season one. And her Snatch Game was Karina. She didn't win that Snatch Game, by the way. Killer Queen won it, but... She was amazing. And now you can see how amazing she was because the other guest judge is the actual Karina. And Poopy does such an amazing job. She's like looking at Karina all the time and doing the same like hand gestures as her and singing the same songs. She's able to follow along this joke so, so, so well. Karina is a very well-known singer from many years ago. She went to Eurovision and I always explain her like um, a little girl trapped in an old lady's body. And you can see like her super pitch voice and she acts all innocent and she's always like singing and super, oh no. <laughs> So we're going to go one by one with all of these references. First of all, the Macarena as Paca la Piraña. 
Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Paca la Piraña. If you haven't seen Veneno, I highly recommend you to watch Veneno. I don't care what you're doing. That show is amazing. It's about the life of Cristina Ortiz La Veneno and it's directed by Los Javis and it's one of my favorite shows ever. Uh, Paca la Piraña was in real life uh, one of the best friends of Veneno and in that show she plays herself. So we, get to, we got to know her watching Veneno very, very much. After that, she was a guest judge in season one, in the episode where they had the Veneno runway. And after that, she's been the co-host of the Spanish tour, El Gran Hotel de las Reinas, with Supreme. So she has toured with the girls. She has worked in a very well-produced show with Los Javis. She knows many of these girls. Macarena has been touring with her for many months for the season one tour. So she knows her very well. And we all are very familiar with Paca. Paca la Piraña is this character that is larger than life and that is always explaining everything with like very nasty rhymes, very like sexual rhymes. Every, everything she says is like a sexual joke rhyming with something she, someone just said. So that's her character. And that's what Macarena did. Macarena had the voice, the character, the accent down to a T, but it wasn't funny. And Paca la Piraña is always very, very funny, but her impersonation was perfect. Bestia is playing La Hierbas, which is a character from a TV show, very well-known TV show in Spain called Aquí no hay quien viva. And this was uh, one of the main characters of the show. And she's like a middle-aged woman Uh, very obsessed with like natural medicine and natural healing. You can see she has a lot of like different types of teas and herbs and like smoking in a pipe and she has a mandala. And again, I think that Bessia did a very good job of being La Hierbas. It is true that you couldn't understand her diction 100%. And this is a problem that Bessia has been having. She had it last last episode and she had it today. But we could kind of understand everything that she was saying. But again, the jokes weren't there, but the impersonation was correct. So good job to Bestia too. Okay, and now the gag, the gag, the gag. Ornella and Vania Vainilla, I have to explain them, both of them, at the same time, because as you can see, they are interacting a lot with each other. Okay, Ornella chose to be, she is so ballsy. She is so fierce. She chose to be our old king. Okay, we had a king for, I don't know, 40 years in Spain, and it was this dude that, well, you know, if you live in a country that doesn't have a monarchy, you don't get to experience all the drama that comes with that. But well, this was Juan Carlos I de Borbón, our old king. The current king is his son, obviously, and... Uh, He is sitting next to Vania Vainilla, who is Barbara Rey. Barbara Rey was a very famous, like, vedette, and she was a sex symbol in, like, the 70s. And it's very well known that Barbara Rey was the king's mistress. The king is very well known for having several mistress and for paying them off and with money that maybe he shouldn't be using for that and that has brought like a lot of, a lot of problems so it's very funny that they both chose those characters without knowing that the other one was going to play the other one and they could bounce off each other so amazingly well there are like a lot of puns and a lot of like internal jokes that you won't get i i cannot explain you like absolutely all of the references But one of the questions for the Snatch Game was about Corina, who was another very well-known mistress of Juan Carlos I. She was paid off millions of euros and it was a big diplomatic crisis. 
So a lot of internal jokes, a lot of paying off Barbara Rey because Barbara Rey uh, has said that she has like recordings of her meetings with Juan Carlos I and those recordings magically disappeared. Someone break into her home and those tapes like aren't there anymore and you can see the king giving her like a lot of money. Uh, amazing, it was so funny. The best part for me about Ornella is not like exactly what she says, even though she's super witty. One of the most witty performances I've ever seen because it's like, even if she's not saying something specific, just the way she's acting is just amazing and so funny and so witty and so clever, so stupid. Um, the best part is when she does this. What am I? Look, what am I? I'm a one euro coin because obviously the one euro coins have the king's face. <laughs> it was just a superb, amazing performance. And it was so ballsy that she chose the, the king. This is a lot more than choosing Donald Trump, for example, like the Vivian did. This is like something that may bring her problems legally, you know? By the way, everything I say about the king is absolutely, allegedly okay. Please don't sue me. Ornella uses all of the sentences that are very well known of the king. She uses... Me llena de orgullo y satisfacción. I'm full of like pride and satisfaction to say whatever or once that the king had to appear publicly and say that he was very sorry and it wouldn't happen again. And, you know, a lot of these sentences that are like internal jokes for Spanish people who are familiar with the king. But it was like tens across the board. And Mania as well, as the mistress, as Barbara Rey, as this vedette, didn't have to do really too much. They didn't have to say many things. It was a lot about the physical comedy. It was about the wittiness. It was about how well, how well the jokes would bounce between each other. We also know that Barbara Rey like, was in the tabloids as well because she had one night of passion and love with a specific famous journalist here in Spain as well. So he had, she had one night with a woman. That's why she was also kissing Lola on the other side. It was a completely amazing, round, well-executed performance for both of them. Pinchadora chose to be Lola Flores. As you may know, if you watch my videos, Lola Flores was a very famous singer, folklorica, an actress, and a very famous person in Spain for like the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and she sadly passed away many years ago, but she's still quite of a legend. Pinchadora does a perfect rendition of Lola Flores, uh, a rendition of Lola Flores specifically from a certain period of time where she did a lot of interview, like very chilled, relaxed interviews, and she spoke about a lot of things. And she has that impersonation down to a T. She said many, many things that were brilliant. First of all, she had packs of cigarettes as earrings, and that's because Lola Flores did a commercial, like an ad, for this tobacco company, which now absolutely doesn't exist. Of course, cigarettes don't have ads anymore, but it was a different time. And she said like, to feel the best that you can ever feel, you have to smoke Winston or whatever, which is crazy nowadays, right? Uh, she loses one of the earrings and that's because Lola Flores very famously lost an, lost an earring in a performance on TV and she stopped the whole thing until she found the freaking earring because it was very expensive, you know? Uh, she does, like, she calls Lisa, Lisa is supposed to be Paulina Rubio and she calls her Shakira, which is like perfect in Lola Flores' mind. They talk about like paying taxes, like the king says, okay, Lola, remember that you have to pay your taxes. And Lola was like, oh, the disrespect. Uh, and that's because Lola had like a very big debt with the Spanish uh, treasure tax collecting. So this performance was very, very, very good, but it wasn't as funny as Ornella and Vania. A lot of girls say that she was talking over a lot of people, but well, 
Lola Flores would have spoken over people. Like, it, it was in character. It made sense. It didn't feel disrespectful. It wasn't like the buffoonery, tomfoolery of it all. It was okay. And I think it wasn't justified saying that she was speaking over people. This is an improv challenge. You have to remember, it's not an impersonation challenge. This is an improv comedy challenge. So you have to be able to do improv. Then my sweet dear Paquita chose to do a version of Peppa Pig, which is like, you know, like a hoe. And uh, you can tell that she wasn't having a good time. She said she was completely dissociating throughout the whole thing. She doesn't remember anything. This is a bit traumatic for her. There's not a single reference that I have to explain you. This was just painful. Clover Bish decided to be Maite Galdeano. To be honest, I didn't know who Maite Galdeano is because she's a reality TV star. So I've been speaking to a lot of people. So thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Manoli. Thank you, everyone that has explained me things about this character in order for me to explain it to you guys. So this is a character that we got to know through Gran Hermano, Big Brother. I think it was like season 16 of Big Brother. I'm not into Big Brother, so I couldn't know who this woman is. And then after that, she has been in many other realities. She entered in this Big Brother competition with her daughter, but I think they couldn't say that they were mother and daughter. And her daughter ended up winning the whole thing. And this lady is like very vulgar and opinionated and over the top. I think you could understand her better if you compare her to someone from like Jersey Shore or maybe some of the housewives but with no money. Like she is a little bit that type of like too much and she says a lot of inappropriate things all the time. So what I've been told is that Clover did amazing as Maite Galdeano that this season had a lot of very good characters for the Snatch Game, but in any other season, Clover Bish would have been on the top. Pitita chose to be Sara Montiel. Sara Montiel was a very famous Spanish singer and actress who was very involved in like the classic old Hollywood. And she has a couple of jokes. For example, there's this very famous story that we all know about Sara Montiel that once cooked eggs a la manchega to Marlon Brando, who was in her kitchen. And she only had like a couple of interactions, I believe. Um, she spoke kind of like Sara Montiel, but again, this character wasn't funny at all whatsoever. And Lisa decided to be Paulina Rubio. She is a Mexican singer. I'm sure you're all familiar with her. But she chose to be a very specific Paulina Rubio because when, you know, the pandemic started and it was the first time we were all in lockdown, if you remember, a lot of artists were doing like live streams through Instagram, like live concerts or whatever. And Paulina Rubio started doing this these Instagram lives where people say that she was like allegedly uh, influenced by several substances. She was probably influenced by alcohol. And people even say that there was a very specific moment from one of those lives where you can see Paulina Rubio doing something like this. I don't know, uh, allegedly, this is all allegedly. <laughs> So Visa did a very good job. She knew how to bring Paulina's energy, her diction, she speaks with all of the mouth and how she's filming Karina and Pupina and all that. Visa did a very good job. She didn't look very much as Paulina Rubio, but it was a very good snatch game for her. Then after the Snatch Game, they are all in the workroom the next day for the runway and the drama starts happening because in one of the reads, Ornella says that Pinchadora has like a double face and Pinchadora is like, me? A double face? 
why am I like Pitita or something? So she involves Pitita in all this. And Pitita is like, girl, I always say what I think. Like, I'm very honest. Like, it's not like you and Macarena they are always talking above each other like and then she involves Macarena and it's like this thing that is getting bigger and bigger and even though it's not the right chronological order I'm going to talk about like the untucked because this conversation follows in the untucked so in the untucked they they were there were only Pitita and Clover and Pitita start saying like not the nicest things about Lisa of course and about Pinchadora and then when Pinchadora comes in she was like oh you did amazing I'm sure they loved you you did amazing and it's like honey weren't you saying that you're not double faced whatsoever and it was all Pinchadora's problem and now you're doing all that in the young talk like I'm kind of living. I love I love double face Pitita, and I think she has to be like more evil, you know. We get to see that Vanya is feeling a little bit better, but it's good that this feels organic, and natural, and you know we've all felt this imposter syndrome and this inner saboteur many times. We know how it feels, so. Uh, it is kind of refreshing that you see like real people with real emotions. I love that they take a moment in the workroom to talk about something that belonged to last week. And it was Ornella's runway about HIV. And because last episode they were talking so much about Visa's story. And I'm sure they didn't have enough time for all of everyone's like fears. And because it was a very vulnerable runway. So Ornella explains that she is very publicly HIV positive, that she is indetectable, so she cannot transmit the virus, and that she's living just a normal life with normal life expectancy and really not many limitations. And she said that she decided to go public because she knew it could help a lot of people throughout this stigma. And I loved the fact that she was speaking with like Bestia and Bania and Lisa and Bestia says like, oh, you're so brave for being so public about it. And Ornella says, no, like, I'm not brave. Like, I wouldn't be brave if I were telling the world that I have diabetes or anything else. I don't think it's a matter of being brave. It's just a matter of tearing down this stigma, you know. And Lisa gave a very interesting perspective that there is also privilege there because where she comes from maybe you don't have the same like sexual education or access to medicines and to healthcare in the same way that we have here that she has lost a friend from this and that there is a privilege in being able to live a very healthy open life with HIV and she thinks that it is very brave where she is from and I don't know, it was a very nice conversation. I'm very glad that even though this was from last episode, they still find, found a little bit of time to talk about this. And if this conversation means that there was no workroom conversations deciding the characters and getting their shit together, I'm okay with that. This week's guest judge is La Terremoto de Alcorcón, La Terre. Um, she is a Spanish drag queen, which just happens to be a cis woman as well. Of course, if you ask the people, they will say, no, yeah, she is like a singer and a comedian and a vedette that wears crazy looks. And they will try to use every single description of a drag queen as possible without saying that she's a drag queen. But La Terremoto defines herself as a travesti as a Spanish drag queen, and that's exactly what she is. And I find kind of stupid that the Los Javis are doing all these remarks about Clover being like a cis woman. Now we're gonna get into her runway and they say the, oh, cis ne, and they say a lot of stupid jokes about that she is a cis drag queen and they're not saying anything to the guest judge who has been being a cis woman drag queen for many, many years and no one says anything about that. I love La Terremoto del Corcón. She is a gay icon in Spain. And I think she has a beautiful energy.
She said in an interview recently that she started being very inspired by Spanish drag queens, travestis, and that it was a, like a very full circle moment when the Spanish drag queen started being influenced by her. So she is part of the girl. She is a drag queen and that's it. This runway category is feathers. So if you haven't watched my episode two, I believe review, in Spain, we have this expression that is called having feathers, uh, tener pluma, and a person has feathers, tiene pluma, when they are like a very flamboyant, limp-wristed gay man. It's all the qualities of a gay man that can let you know that they are gay. So when we talk about Pluma in Spain, we talk about feathers. There is like the literal layer about the feathers of the birds, but then there is like the metaphoric layer that having feathers is a celebration of your queerness, of your flamboyance, of being limp-wristed, of being effeminate and finding pride in that. So Cloverbish is the first one to come out. She has this beautiful outfit with all of the feathers. She said she's inspired in the black swan. Um, I think this looked uh, amazing. I was getting a different reference because when she came out, my I was watching it with my daughter, and my daughter said that it looked like when you are, do you know when many years ago, people used to get like tar poured all over them and then they got feathers on that tar so they got stuck. Uh, my daughter thought it was about that and I thought it was like genius. It could have been like a very glam drag interpretation of that. But you know, I'm just like inventing references that aren't there. This is about Clover's past as a ballerina, as a dancer. So she's inspired in the Black Swan. Black Swan, Swan in Spanish is said cisne, so it has the word cis in it. So Los Javis are just joking about the fact that she says like so much that is almost like cringy, to be honest. The outfit was amazing. Some people say that it looked like it was swallowing her because Clover is kind of small and it was all this was kind of big. But I think it was correct. It is a little bit swallowy, but it, it, that's because it is very, very, very draggy. And I think she had enough presence under all that that you could still see Clover. Pincha's runway was very cute too. So you know that you guys have the goose that led the golden eggs? Uh, that in Spain is not a goose, it's a hen. So she is this hen, this chicken. She has the chicken feet, she has the red thingy and all the feathers. She looks gorgeous, she looks glamorous. She comes into one side of the runway and she lays a golden egg of course, and she always finds time and spaces where to put the little bit of camp. And here it was with the feet, obviously, and with the golden egg. It was a very good job for being chadora this runway. La Macarena, this is another one that you may not have understood. She was referencing Maria Jimenez, who is not another of our Spanish folkloricas singers. To explain Maria Jimenez just very quickly, she's like the epitome of like a boss ass bitch that has no problem living life to the fullest and you know, drinking a little bit and smoking, being just the boss ass bitch that she is. And she had this very famous look and it's recreated here by Macarena. It is true that it looked like it stopped from the waist down, but these feathers are so expensive that I don't think that she could have made the whole outfit out of these feathers like the original Maria Jimenez one. But well, maybe she could have done something, a skirt or something. But Macarena was very proud of losing a lot of her weight and she had no padding on, almost no cinching, just a couple pairs of stockings. And she was proud to show her body. So the reference was super cool. Paquita comes out with this look like a dark vivid. This is very much Paquita's like dark aesthetic. I love it. She's always like so fashion forward and so beautiful. And many times she's beautiful in an almost like disturbing way. And I love this about her. This runway was amazing, but you know, it was a hard week for Paquita.
Pitita comes out as a quill, you know, the quill you write with, like the old people would write with like an ink and quill. That in Spain we call the quill feather, and we even call like the fountain pens, we call them feathers as well. So it, she is this writing quill, and she looks very nice. She took it to a different level. It reminded me a little bit almost of like, um, Carmen Farala's veneno look with like the snake. It's something big, different. But I thought it was funny the way that explaining her runway said that, yeah, I always take it to different places. And I took it to a place that was less literal. And I'm like, what about this is less literal? You took it to the most literal place that you could take it. Bestia's look, I'm glad that they took the time to explain it because not in every franchise they explain the things that aren't understood. It was like a very, like an armor, like a very gay armor, but from every single crevice you could see that there were like red feathers just coming out of every single crevice like the blood and the red feather and the fact that it means like your flamboyance. So it's like you put on this armor, but you can't stop all this feather from coming out of you. You know, it's unstoppable, the feather. Saying all this, I don't think this was the most flattering, cool look for Vestia, but I love that they explained the reference. I love what it means, you know, but, but yeah. Ornella Gongora's look was again like a little bit more metaphorical looking. This looked super cool. Maybe people don't consider this like super fashion, but she's going to a space of more like underground performative art and drag. And that's actually where Ornella comes from, you know? And she's referencing uh, another artist, a performative artist in Spain that was her colleague in a party called Que Trabaje Rita. And that's Sansano Nasnas. And she recreated this thing that Sansano did with his face. She usually put like a lot of things on her face and that was the look that she used to use. So this is like quite self-referential inside of like Spanish performative arts. It is a little bit more of a metaphor, you know? She said that she was referencing an animal from mythology that had the body of an owl and the face of a lady and she decided to invert that. And she has like the face of an owl and the body of a lady of a vedette. Uh, I don't know what mythological animal she was talking about, but if you know, leave it down below. I don't know if they're like the original mermaids or if it's someone from maybe Russian mythology. If you know, just leave it down below. But I loved this look for Nela. She took it to a whole different place, literal place, referential. She did amazing. I'm so happy for her. Vanya Vainilla comes out with this look and this is just out of this world. This is an original cabaret look from one of the most famous cabarets in the world, Lido from Paris. And this is just amazing. This must be so expensive. This has like feathers coming out of absolutely everywhere. I'm sure this is borrowed, but she looks just like everything I like about Banya, but on steroids. This is the most like old school vedette revista cabaret style that you can imagine. This was just outstanding. I am so impressed. And Visa also brings an amazing look. Uh, she is a Katrina. Katrinas, you know, are like a Mexican thing from El Dia de Muertos uh, with like the skull face with the big, it's usually like a Mexican hat and all these like luxurious clothes. And uh, she did this interpretation that was absolutely out of this world. I think Pitita was not very fair in the Untucked saying that it was like too much all the time and she hopes the judges say something to her and whatever. Uh, because this is a lot, of course it is a lot, but it is a lot of amazingness. Like the proportions of the hat and the feathers, the inside of the hat, like 
I was screaming to my TV. Uh, I think this was amazing for Visa. I love Visa. I love her energy. I'm loving Vani as well. I'm loving Ornella, even Pinchadora. I'm loving so many people. So now for the decisions. In the top, we have Ornella, Pinchadora, Vania, and Visa. And honestly, I think we were all thinking that the most obvious thing is for this to be a double win with Ornella and Vania. Los Javi say that it, 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 the character wasn't like completely there and like the prosthetics for Ornella were falling a little bit. Uh, but it is not true. They were exactly a perfect Snatch Game representation. But after these looks, after these this Vanya look, and after what Ornella did in the Snatch Game, I think it was more than fair. I don't know what's going on this season, but I saw this meme online, and it's like Ornella and Paquita... Uh, every time that they should be on the top or they should be winning, they're not. And instead of that, Pinchadora and, and Pitita are winning a lot of the times when people weren't expecting them to win. But I must say that Pinchadora did do an amazing job as Lola Flores. It wasn't as funny because the situation wasn't as funny as the one that Ornella and Vania had going on. But she did play the part perfectly. Maybe the look was not the most awesome, but it was a very funny, well-executed look for the feather category. And being tethered as the winner, but she was so surprised when she got the news that she said that Ornella did a very good job as well and that she wants to share the prize with Ornella, which I think is like, who does that? You know, like who, who does that? Who says like, oh, I win? Oh, I think this other person deserves it. I'm going to share it with them. I think that was like a super A-class thing for Pinchadora. She didn't have to do that whatsoever, but she did anyway. Remember that this is the second time she wins. The first time she won, uh, everyone thought that Clover Bish was going to win. So it's the second time that she wins. And maybe she wasn't expecting it either of those times. So... I'm super proud of Pinchadora for this. I'm very happy that she's sharing the prize with Ornella. And I'm happy that these things can happen in Drag Race España. Then in the bottom, we have Bestia, Macarena, and Paquita. And the bottom two lip syncing are Macarena and Paquita. Paquita has been a front runner, as you know. And Macarena has been doing very well, especially like last week. Both of them did amazing. These two queens have known each other for the longest time and they're probably the two queens that are like closer and dearest, dearest to my heart. They're the queens that I consider like my friends. So we were all crying very much and I know that I'm like completely biased but I thought that this lip sync was beautiful. I thought it was like so honest and well executed and it played with the song. The song was Desatame by Monica Naranjo. This is a huge gay anthem in Spain. And in the first season, in the episode one, when Macarena was eliminated for the first time, that was also to a Monica Naranjo song. So it's kind of a curse. And when she came out with all these peacock feathers, La Terra de Guest Judge say, be careful because peacock feathers are like bad luck and whatever. And they were bad luck because the winner of the lip sync was Paquita and Macarena very sadly has to leave. I must say that in my opinion, Macarena didn't have to be in the bottom. I would have put Pitita in the bottom before Macarena, but maybe it was the look that balanced it out in a different way. But she could have stayed perfectly. She didn't do a bad job whatsoever this episode. And I love when they leave doing a good job, you know, because it feels completely different and like the love of the viewers is completely different. So I'm super proud of La Macarena. By the way, she has a new single coming out this Wednesday. So stay tuned for that because it's a super cool song. So Paquita stays one more week. I'm happy for my girl. Super sad to see Macarena leave. I'm happy for the winners. I'm happy in general for Drag Race because I think they're picking up 
they were dropping the ball at the beginning of the season, but now it's like back in full force. We're starting to have like a little bit of drama, which I love, and like honest conversations, which I love. So if you're not listening yet, remember that I am reviewing this whole season in Joseph Shepard's podcast, Exposed. So go listen to that. Also, you have other reviewers covering the season. You have, in English, you have Mari Rantz, and in Spanish, you have all my beautiful friends. You have Parody Paradise and Licos. Go watch them all and support them all. If you want to support my channel, you have my PayPal account down below. I must say that for this episode, I may not be able to have subtitles for this video because my computer just broke and I don't have any money to fix it or to buy a new one. So if you want to help with that as well, you have my PayPal down below. I want to know in the comments down below if you liked the Snatch Game, even if you didn't understand the references. I'm interested in that because I think that even if you know who everyone is, you know who's doing a good job or not. And I want to know if it was enjoyable for you guys as well. And I'll see you here next week. Thank you so much. I love you all. Stay queer.